we're on for five past, so I'm going to get started. So a formal hello to everyone. Uh, welcome to today's Gothic Women panel on Gothic Motherhood. I'm Laura Kirkley, I'm a lecturer at Newcastle University, and I've been slowly progressing some research on the darker sides of maternity for quite some time at this point. So I'm really excited to be chairing today's panel. Um, I'm joined by other members of the Gothic Women team, um, Deborah Russell from York University, there she is waving, um, Daniel Cook from Dundee University, Anna Mercer from Cardiff University, and our indispensable Bars funded events fellow Lauren Nixon, um, who has just popped our code of conduct in the chat, so, so just um, do check that out. Um, and we've got three fantastic speakers here today, uh, Marilyn Frankis, Dara Reguignon and Violana Shuka. Um, I will introduce them in a lot more detail at the moment, um, in a moment, but just before we get going, I've got a few quick requests. Um, firstly, if you're in the audience, could you please ensure that unless you're asking a question, your microphone and your camera are switched off? Um, that's just to avoid any unnecessary disruption and to keep the Zoom connection as stable as possible. Um, during the papers, the Gothic Women team will keep their cameras switched on so that the speakers don't have that slightly unnerving experience of just talking to a blank wall. Um, although we will also switch off if we think the connection is affected. Um, we'll have questions at the end, but if you do think of a question during one of the papers, do feel free to pop it in the chat if you would like to. Um, if you put a queue in front of it, um, that'll make it easier for us to pick up and then we can invite you to, to answer it at the end, um, to ask it at the end, of course. Um, also, if you if you would like, if you're on Twitter and you'd like to tweet about us, um, that would be fabulous. Um, so please, if you if you're going to do that, could you use the Gothic Women hashtag, which is hashtag Gothic Women with a capital G and a capital W. Um, I'd also like to um, uh, just give a, a trigger warning at the start of this uh, panel. Um, some of the content we're talking about today is sensitive. Um, we'll be alluding to topics like miscarriage and preterm birth, abortion, domestic violence and suicide. Um, so a trigger warning there. And if you are tweeting about any of that material, if you could please just stick a TW trigger warning signifier at the, at the start of the tweet so that people can just manage how they digest that content. So that, that'd be fantastic, everyone. Um, okay. Um, I think that's everything. Um, so I think we can now move on to our first speaker, uh, who is Marilyn Frankis. Uh, she is a professor of English at West Virginia University. Um, she is the author of Monstrous Motherhood, 18th Century Culture and the Ideology of Domesticity, and the former editor of Bernie Journal. Her latest essay, Hiding in Plain Sight, Frances Burney as satiric novelist, appears in British Women Satirists of the Long 18th Century, edited by Amanda Heiner and Elizabeth Tasker Davis. Um, and it was published by Cambridge University Press this month. Marilyn is editing a special issue of Afro Ben Online on shaping the legacy of 18th century women. And she's working on a book on the origins of the mommy wars. Um, and as a Wollstonecraft scholar, I am very much looking forward to her paper, which is titled Motherhood as Gothic Experience, Wollstonecraft's The Wrongs of Woman. Thank you. I want to thank Laura Kirkley and the organizers of the Gothic Women Project for inviting me to the seminar today. It's lovely to be here. I'd like to speak about Mary Wollstonecraft's The Wrongs of Woman, a text that's characterized by elements of the Gothic, the presence of unreliable, if not destructive patriarchs, physical confinement, death and haunting, and unusual sexual proclivities, anxiety, and identity crises. I'm telling you my premises here, because the Gothic's a very expansive mode. I'm not going to attempt to define the genre here because we could probably spend the entire session defining the Gothic and maybe not even coming up with a solution. 
I recognize that there are other elements of the Gothic afoot like supernatural subversion and horror, but I figured we would start there. What's striking to me is the degree to which the wrongs of woman is saturated with Gothic elements. For not only Mariah, the protagonist undergoes Gothic experience, but almost every woman does. And almost every woman in the wrongs of woman is a mother. This maternal world is a world of spousal abuse, adultery, men raping and impregnating servants, infanticide, attempts to turn wives into prostitutes, and the madhouse. By presenting the Gothic as typical and inescapable, as normative, Wollstonecraft is not only criticizing a legal and social system that denies women marital, legal, and economic rights, but she's exposing the Gothic as a genre and a form of popular entertainment. And I recognize that this might be heresy in this forum, but please bear with me. For some scholars like Janet Todd, The Wrongs of Woman is a sequel to the vindication of the rights of women. And I can see that argument and I concur. For in The Wrongs of Woman, Wollstonecraft is making a case for women's equality to man under the law. Women's equality as a parent, as a sexual being, an owner of property, and in her ability to control her own body. But the fictional format of the wrongs of woman clearly differs from the vindication, and I believe that's a conscious choice. It's worth noting that William Godwin claimed that the wrongs of woman was written slowly and deliberately unlike the vindication, which was written at white heat. Wollstonecraft had written fiction before, not only Mary of Fiction, but also original stories from real life, both published in 1788, considerably before The Wrongs of Woman. It's not surprising that Wollstonecraft would turn to the Gothic, which was an astonishingly popular genre in the 1790s, as you all know. And Radcliffe made a lot of money writing Gothic novels, profiting by eliciting sensations of horror in her readers and by depicting female suffering at the hands of patriarchy. Frances Burney wrote in her journal about Radcliffe's profits. And if Burney knew, presumably other writers did too. Radcliffe's novels rationalized Gothic's find and find a way to explain their supernatural effects and provide their heroines with some sort of contentment, if not happiness at the end. But they defy real experience. That's part of their pleasure and their entertainment value. Wollstonecraft was committed for advocating women, for women, and the Gothic as a genre seemed bent on terrorizing them. As an author, it's not surprising that Wollstonecraft would see the Gothic as a vehicle for her message to the public. But as a philosopher, educator, and mother who envisioned mothers as central to the raising and educating of children and of citizens and to the health of society, the Gothic was another a mechanism that oppressed women and normalized their oppression through maternal absence, death, and abuse. To push the Gothic to the limit in the wrongs of woman is another way to advocate for women's rights. I have argued elsewhere that 18th century mothers are constructed as monstrous when they are present and have agency, when they speak, tell their stories, attempt to control the narrative, or when mothers are protagonists. For all the conduct manuals and discourse about good mothers, In the period, the literary and social narratives rarely depicted a good mother. The best mothers in literature are usually the dead ones, as the saying goes. This is convenient for psychoanalytic critics, especially Lacanians, who believe that the absence of the mother is necessary for the development of language and narrative, as if mothers don't have narratives themselves. However, the 18th century is filled with narratives of wicked mothers, infanticidal mothers, and spectral mothers, the former to present, the latter partially present, many of whom fit in the Gothic mode. The Gothic expresses and then suppresses maternal monstrosity by giving mothers agency in hideous evil ways in order to demonize mothers and or displace mothers and kill them. 
when the Gothic recovers mothers, as in the case of say Radcliffe's The Italian, it's to displacement, displace them in the end by the marriage of the heroine, for instance. In those works, mothers are not protagonists and the mother's story is rarely told from her perspective. But mothers are agents in the wrongs of women, which is plot intensive like many Gothic works, which allows Wollstonecraft to include many permutations of female oppression. Let's begin chronologically with Mariah's mother. Mariah describes her parents' marriage as less than happy. Her father, as a retired captain of a man of war, married and, quote, he was instantly obeyed, especially by my mother, whom he very benevolently married for love, but took care to remind her of the obligation when she dared in the slightest instance to question his absolute authority. Mariah's mother does not nurse her. She is an absent presence, much like the spectral mothers of the traditional Gothic, or as Mariah puts it, my mother had an indolence of character which prevented her from paying much attention to our education. Wollstonecraft had much to say about such mothers in original stories and the vindication, none of it complimentary. Mariah's father takes a mistress while his wife is dying. So we can add adultery to other forms of his spousal misbehavior. Mariah's mother, solemnly recommended my sisters to my care and bid me to be a mother to them as she is dying. Another move as she anticipates her death and spectrality. While this is all going on, while her mother is dying, Mariah discovered the ruined state of my father's circumstances and that he had only been able to keep up appearances by the sums he borrowed of my uncle. So chronologically, we start with emotional abuse, adultery, patriarchal incompetence, maternal death, and spectralization. I submit to you that this is kind of the baseline for the Gothic, and it's a way to contain maternal power and authority. It's also worth noting that Mariah's father's mistress is an artful kind of upper servant in the house who attracted his attention. So Mariah is suggesting that the servant is preying on the father, but it's not clear whether the father is preying on the servant. Mariah also notices that while her father's mistress is pregnant, the mistress is also trying to seduce her younger brother. It's gothic. So there are shades of incest and deceit here as well. Mariah's comment about all of this is quite telling. By allowing women, but one way, of rising in the world, the fostering of libertinism of men, society makes monsters of them. And then their ignoble vices are brought forward as proof of inferiority of intellect. The inequality of the sexes, the inability of women to have equal access to education and opportunity. This is all shades of the vindication leads to monstrosity, vice, sexual deviance, all markers of the Gothic and all sanctioned by patriarchal law, if not generated by patriarchal law. Onto Mariah. Mariah's narrative has plenty markers of the Gothic, including her imprisonment in a madhouse by her husband. And there are shades of womb and tomb in that madhouse as prisons are. Plenty of unreliable patriarchs, including her father, her elder brother, and of course her husband. Death of her mother, one of her sisters, and eventually her child, and haunting. Mariah's written narrative is compensation for her absence, for the absence of her daughter, and a sign of her displacement. She is haunted by the loss of her infant while she is incarcerated. The very beginning of the text says her infant's image was continually floating on Mariah's sight. And she feels that absence physically since they are separated while she is still nursing. Mariah is also anticipating that her daughter will be haunted by her loss, that she will be a spectral mother. 
which is why Mariah writes her text to instruct her daughter, much like the educational man manuals of the 18th century, like Sarah Pennington's An Unfortunate Mother's Advice to Her Absent Daughters from 1767, or the text that Mrs. Mason leaves behind for the girls that she mentors in Wollstonecraft's original stories. This was a common trope in the 18th century. When Mariah learns that her daughter is dead, she's haunted by the fact that she could not save her daughter, for no one would care for her daughter the way she would, and that her text is now useless. Everything is a reminder of what is loss. George Hackerty kind of refers to this as the erotics of loss of the Gothic. Mariah is haunted by not being able to be a loving parent, just as she's haunted by the fact that her parents could have been loving parents and were not. This ongoing spectralization of Mariah is caused by men as they fail to meet her needs and police and attempt to contain her actions. The few men who do not attempt to control Mariah, her uncle in Darnford, have a way of disappearing. Her uncle goes to Europe and then dies, and Darnford must leave to protect his inheritance as Mariah heads to court. Much has been made of Mariah's testimony, including the fact that it would have been highly unlikely for a woman to testify in court in a criminal conversation case. Mariah claims that she supported her husband's malnourished, illegitimate child more than he does. And that's another case of a master preying on a servant. In addition to dealing with her husband's infidelities, his efforts to take her fortune and her uncle's, his attempt to prostitute her, and his imprisonment of her. Under such oppression, she admits adultery, but not seduction by Darnford, and requests a divorce. The judge dismisses Mariah's testimony as feelings, not evidence, and discounts her request. As a married woman, Mariah is a femme couvert and not a legal entity in her own right. And the law too erases her. The law functionally spectralizes her. The judge reasserts that erasure by claiming that, quote, if women were allowed to plead their feelings as an excuse or palliation of infidelity, it was opening a floodgate for immorality. So George, her husband, can commit adultery, kidnapping, extortion, attempt prostitution, incarcerate her wife, his wife, and that's acceptable under the law. Because, quote, it was her duty to love and obey the man chosen by her parents and relations who were qualified by their experience to judge better for her than she could for herself. The sexual double standard and the absurdity of the situation could not be clearer, nor could the ongoing horror here. Plenty of women are married to men who abuse them and there is no escape. Reality is Gothic and it's not entertaining. The story of Jemima, Mariah's jail, re jailer, reinforces this message as it's a series of abuses and horrors inflicted on the working class, featuring death, haunting, rape, adultery, abortion, and prostitution. Mariah's mother, a servant, is seduced by another servant, and she dies nine days after Mer Jemima's born. Jemima feels that loss all her life as she states, now I look back, I cannot help attributing the greater part of my misery to the misfortune of having been thrown into the world without the grand support of, my, of life, a mother's affection. Jemima is haunted by maternal loss as she is subjected to wicked stepmother narrative when her father marries, and she's asked to act as her stepsister's servant. Jemima is then sent out to apprentice and she is repeatedly raped by her employer. When Jemima becomes pregnant, she's ejected by the lady of the house who blames her for her situation given a and given a potion to induce abortion, which works. Her employers refuse to give her a good character, so she's forced to beg and eventually drifts into prostitution. The horrors of prostitution are relieved when she becomes a mistress, for then she has time to read and learn. But when her lover dies, she's back on the streets and she admits to be cut off from human converse now, when I had been taught to relish it, was to wander a ghost among the living. 
she feels spectralized. Jemima gets work as a washerwoman. She becomes a Gothic agent when she convinces a tradesman to abandon a girl in his house who he impregnated. So once again, we have another situation of an employer preying on a servant. The pregnant girl commits suicide and Jemima is haunted by her. She refuses to stay with the tradesman. Jemima becomes injured. She's confined to a hospital where doctors experiment on the poor who cannot leave. That's a gothic horror. From there, she becomes a thief, sentenced to a workhouse, and eventually ends up in the position in a madhouse. Well, Jemima is not a biological mother. It's not clear whether that abortive patient affected her permanently. For seemingly, she doesn't become pregnant while she's a sex worker. She's a nurturer, as witnessed by her behavior to Mariah and Darnford. She's haunted by her mother, sensitized to mothers, as evidenced in her horror by the suicide of the tradesman's mistress. And her problems tend to be caused by men, irresponsible patriarchs her father, her employer, and a working world largely defined by men that doesn't provide job opportunities for women to earn a reasonable living other than in prostitution. Her confinements in the hospital and the workhouse may not be purely Gothic incarnations, but she bristles against them. So when she concludes her story by saying, whoever acknowledged me to be a fellow creature Jemima feels that she's barely perceived to be human. Her sense of being made monstrous by her experience comes through loud and clear. So for those who are keeping count, I hope you've been keeping count. There are six mothers who are experiencing and or perpetuating the Gothic and the wrongs of woman. Mariah's mother, Mariah, George Venable's dead lover, whose child Mariah is taking care of. Jemima's mother, Jemima, and the tradesman's seduced and abandoned lover. If you count stepmother experience as part of the Gothic narrative, either as cause or an effect, then add Mariah's stepmother and Jemima's stepmother to the list. That's eight. I would also add Jemima's wet nurse, who is used to seeing children die and not preventing it, and from whom Jemima received no kindness as a child, and Darnford's mother, who, in a marriage of mutual dislike, was an absent, indifferent parent who died young. That raises the total to 10. There are a few women who escape the unrelenting Gothic motherhood and the wrongs of women, but not many. Mariah's sisters who do not become mothers, the landlady who Mariah encounters in her flight from George, who's married but not identified as a mother, but she's abused by her husband by the way. It's not clear whether Mary, Mariah's childhood nurse, has a family, but her sister Peggy does, and Peggy may be the only mother in the novella to avoid the gothic. However, she sinks into poverty, which does not seem like a wonderful alternative to the gothic either. So I return to my initial point. Almost every mother in the wrongs of woman is living a gothic experience. If my count is correct, 10 out of 11 mothers in the wrongs of women experience some form of Gothic motherhood. And that's astonishing. There's no free song of delight or suspense here. There's pain, frustration, sorrow, and haunting. The child mortality rate is high as well, as four children die and two children are never born. For Wollstonecraft's Gothic mothers, there's no Radcliffian comfort and no contentment at the end. There's death or a judge telling them to be dutiful to their husbands who can do whatever they want. For those who like to read Wollstonecraft biographically, and I don't find myself bound to do so, but it's a viable reading. This resonates strongly with Wollstonecraft's perception of her parents' marriage, her sister Eliza's marriage, and her own challenging relationship with Gilbert Imlay. Wollstonecraft's version of the Gothic is not to show what's lurking behind the curtain or down the dark corridor, but to show that real all too Gothic suffering of women who are not equals under the law, and she's demanding justice. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Marilyn. That was fantastic. Um, I really, really enjoyed that. Um, and I, you know, I've read that that novel so many times, and I had never just sat and enumerated the, the sheer number of gothic experiences and and how much they pertain to mothers. So um, yeah, that's that's so so interesting. Thank you. Um, okay, so without further ado, I'm going to move on to our next speaker, um, who is Dara Rossman Regenion. She is an associate professor in the NYU Department of English, where she teaches 19th century British literature and culture, as well as rhetoric and writing studies. Her second book, Writing Maternity, Medicine, Anxiety, Rhetoric and Genre, was published by Ohio State University Press in 2021. The book historicizes the anxious affects of middle class motherhood and offers a literary rhetorical history of maternal anxiety as a cultural formation. Dara has also published on writing fellows programs, writing pedagogy and children's literature, and she's currently at work on her next project, Vulnerable Rhetorics, which is a study of how elite women's claims of gendered, classed and racialized vulnerability underwrote and justified imperial expansion in the late 19th century British Empire. Her paper today is also delightfully Wollstonecrafty, um, and it's titled Mariah, an experiment in rhetorical motherhood. Uh, thank, thank you, you, Laura, for the introduction and Deborah for the invitation and just the whole Gothic Women team for, for putting this together. Um, I'm, I'm really enjoying it already. I'm very excited at the way Marilyn's thinking and mine sort of intersects and diverges um, from one another's. Um, I am putting um, a accessibility link to a um, online version of my um, paper for anyone who would like to be reading along and there's a link within that to the slides or the text on the slides that I'll be showing. Um, I wanted to start with a, a land acknowledgement. Um, I'm speaking to you from New York City, which is located on Lenape Hooking, the ancestral homelands of the Lenape people. I want to recognize the continued significance of these lands for Lenape nations past and present. And at this moment, want to honor that community, the ancestors, and past, present, and emerging Lenape leaders. New York City has the largest urban indigenous population in the United States. I believe that addressing structural indigenous exclusion and erasure is critically important, and I'm committed to actively working to overcome the ongoing effects and realities of settler colonialism and racial capitalism within this city and within the institutions where I work. Um, so I'm actually going to begin at the end, or rather the ends, of Wollstonecraft's Mariah or the Wrongs of Woman. Um, she left it unfinished at the time of her death from complications following the birth of her second daughter, but she provided notes toward multiple possible endings. As we've just heard, but I'll rehearse it quickly anyway, the primary narrative of the novel is that of Mariah Venables, separated from her infant daughter and incarcerated in an insane asylum by the husband she left. Interrupted by the narratives of her jailer and then sort of serving woman, Jemima, and then more briefly by that of her lover, Henry Darnford, Mariah's story breaks off completely after she has unsuccessfully defended Darnford and sort of therefore herself from charges of adultery. Wollstonecraft's notes sketch out possibilities for the remaining narrative that both align and pull against one another. In all of them, Mariah is divorced by her husband and separated from her lover. In most, her daughter dies and she falls pregnant for a second time and miscarries. In one, she then commits suicide and in another, she is saved on the brink of death by the miraculous return of her young daughter who she thought was dead. It's in particular these last two contradictory endings that I want us to keep in mind. In a sense, the tragic and comedic possible outcomes of Mariah's tale. Um, I want us to keep in mind that at the end of this novel, we have, in the sense, a double ending. Mother and daughter both die, mother and daughter both live. In a sense, then, I'm asking us to disregard the biographical and take the text as both complete and experimental. And I'm going to share my screen so that you can have some um, passages that have shaped my thinking. Uh, starting with this beautiful one from uh, Sadia Hartman. Um, so in a sense, I'm understanding in Hartman's terms, Mariah as a beautiful experiment um, in rhetorical maternity, 
an experiment that is errant, recalcitrant, anarchic, troublesome, wayward, a practice of possibility. Hartman develops this theory in her moving evocation of the lives of young Black women in Philadelphia and New York at the turn of the last century. In borrowing this concept to think about the writing of an English woman a century earlier, I don't want to suggest that Wollstonecraft's experience of marginalization, oppression, or disempowerment is directly comparable to that of Hartman's subjects, or that the experiences of the characters she describes are, um, although I think that her argument is that in certain ways that it is. Um, to do so, I think would create a false equivalency to lose some of the essential specificities of both experiences and historical moments. To my mind, it would also importantly erase some of the very specific oppressions attendant to the experience of black Americans living in the wake of chattel slavery. But by understanding the wrongs of women as a beautiful experiment in writing motherhood in rhetorical maternity, we can glimpse the possibility it's possibilities it practices, possibilities that did not gain historical purchase, but that can perhaps help us imagine revolutionary fissures in longstanding cultural formations. So in writing maternity, I argue that the rhetorical situation of middle class motherhood as a cultural form developed in the 1820s, and it was centered on and produced anxiety as a defining maternal affect. A rhetorical situation is the arrangement of persons, conditions, objects, and relationships that requires discourse to be addressed or resolved. Two acquaintances meeting on the street requires a greeting. The presentation of a gift requires an expression of thanks. The distribution of an assignment to a class requires questions, meetings, requests for meetings and extensions, and ultimately, one hopes, student essays. The rhetorical situation of motherhood became saturated with and constitutive of maternal anxiety, I argue, not simply through the utterances or rhetorical acts of writing mothers, but also through a variety of other textual acts and genres that shaped the material and affective conditions of that situation. So it's essential to my thinking that those writing mothers, um, which is to say women writing as mothers, whether or not they were by biologically or biographically mothers, were taking up and recirculating extant rhetorical and affective possibilities. So Mariah inverts the usual role of the mother in Gothic fiction, as Marilyn's described. Um, so rather than mother-daughter separation somehow facilitating the daughter's adventures, Wollstonecraft is centering the experience on that of a mother who has been disappeared. Um, so I'm reading the novel both as containing representations of rhetorical motherhood and also as a contribution to the rhetorical ecology or rhetorical situation of motherhood as it was sort of developing and emerging at this time. One of the animating tragedies of the novel, of course, is the character's separation from her daughter before the action of it the novel begins, and her subsequent awareness of all that she does not know about how the infant fares. This is, of course, written on her body through leaking breasts and was rooted, rooted in legitimate concern given the higher death rates of non-breastfed children. Her biography, um, her interpolated biography is, of course, memoirs written for her daughter that are presented narratively just after the daughter is reported dead. The memoirs are offered as educational and specifically offering an education that quote unquote, only a mother could provide. They open, addressing these memoirs to you, my child, uncertain whether I shall ever have an opportunity of instructing you, many observations will probably flow from my heart, which only a mother, a mother schooled in misery could make. This insistence on the particularity and peculiar passion of maternal love is one aspect of the rhetorical maternity Wollstonecraft enacts. Motherhood in Mariah is a distinctive maternal experience, one that frequently transcends Mariah's ability to describe it. When recalling the child, that the child was taken from her breast while she was in a drugged sleep, for example, she stops herself to repress a mother's anguish. The narrator similarly emphasizes this. Mariah is tortured by maternal apprehension early on. Her infant's image was continually floating on Mariah's sight and the first smile of intelligence remembered as none but a mother, an unhappy mother can conceive. And then later, um, in, in the same passage as I've highlighted in blue, right? Who would watch her with a mother's tenderness, a mother's self-denial? 
So motherhood emerges as a distinctive emotional state state, tender, self-denying, anguished, unhappy, that can only be experienced by those who inhabit that subject and rhetorical position. At the same time, the repetitive structure of Mar Mariah generalizes the experiences of this specific unfortunate mother as part and parcel or potential of the experiences of being female under coverture, 10 of 11 of the mothers we've heard. Um, so these stories and the repetition of this story, in a sense, reinforces Wollstonecraft's critique of the situation of women and extends it across classes. The rhetoric and essentialist experience of motherhood are fundamental to this, providing key moments of recognition and identification across those repetitions. Mariah enacts rhetorical motherhood as the desolate and inadequate utterances of a woman separated from her child and as an affective state that moves between and connects women across classes. I would describe Mariah as an anxious mother in a very commonsensical way, although surely in extraordinary and justifiable circumstances. She is worried about her daughter in specific and in general terms. That is, she worries about what is happening to the child right now because the child is her daughter and has been taken from her. And she is also worried about the child, what is going to happen to the child because she is a girl in an oppressive patriarchal culture. But I also want to think about how Wollstonecraft draws on aspects of maternal anxiety as a cultural formation. In the 1790s, the emergent, nat nat the, sorry, the emergent nature of this formation makes different uptakes possible, uptakes that gesture toward, I think, utopian possibilities on the other side of tragedy. So I, to define maternal anxiety, I draw on the work of Sarah Ahmed, as well as that of Sigmund Freud and Søren Kierkegaard. And again, I've given you some of the, the quotes that, that shape my thinking here. As I see it, um, maternal anxiety is an emotion generated by and generating temporal and spatial movement. In other words, the what ifs of anxiety recognize oncoming future danger through its similarity to the past, and it invoke the what ifs invoke dangerous possibilities happening in the moment but out of sight. Maternal subjects are then constituted as paying attention, as it were, in all directions at once, to the symptom that might or might not be a sign of a deadly illness, to the tendency that might develop into a vice in adulthood, to what is going on just out of sight in the nursery or the schoolroom. Charged with children's literal survival, moral training, and their replication of parental values in the next generation, motherhood as a cultural formation is predicated on the simultaneous possibility and impossibility of total knowledge and control. One can't, after all, be in all places at once. By separating Mariah from her daughter and simultaneously envisioning that separation as permanent and temporary, the novel is a rhetorical experiment in the possibilities of anxious maternal subjectivity. Uh, in a 2017 article, Catherine Temple reads Mariah as a, quote, manifesto in support of a new, agitated, and thus revolutionary form of legal subjectivity, unquote, a legal subjectivity that is both embodied and feeling and that moves constantly and restlessly. For Temple, agitation not only, and I'm quoting again, results from dissonance between the way things should be and the way they are, it also expresses that dissonance, exhibiting in body, in mannerisms, and on the page that something is radically wrong, unquote. I'm thinking today of agitation in Temple's terms as related to maybe even a species of anxiety or anxiety as a species of agitation. And I'm quite convinced that anxiety is a agitated emotion moving constantly between what might be in the future out of sight and what is. If Mariah's agitation, her anxiety, is a potential basis for legal subjectivity, then Wollstonecraft is reaching for not just different legal rights for women, including as mothers, but also a different understanding of maternal anxiety itself. In returning to the endings of Mariah, I want us not to choose between suicide and rescue, but to hold them suspended in relation to one another. I want to think of this moment in the narrative as a crossroads and ourselves at the moment, at the dizzy moment of facing but not yet making a choice. And for this Kierke for Kierkegaard, this is the central anxious moment. For him, it's a productive emotion because 
the the dizzy paralysis when faced with a choice um, is what is what animates the possibility of choosing. Godwin's editorial note here describes the survival ending as having been superscribed. I have not seen or seen further description of the manuscript of Mariah, but this reference is evocative. Literally written above, superscription could indicate that this longer conclusion to the novel was sketched in the margins. It might be overflowing across the top and down the sides of the page, or it might appear interlinearly, lines of the different endings alternating, but of course one breaks off, miscarriage, suicide, while the other continues. On the page, they both exist, jostling, dissonant, incompatible and incommensurate, agitated two alternative futures and a refusal to choose. The what if logic of anxiety is imaginative. Anticipatory and full of motion, anxiety understands the here and the now in terms of what else might be. In other contexts, aesthetic, entrepreneurial, this is understood in positive terms. In its rise to dominance with industrialization, capitalist patriarchy defined a version of those qualities, that tendency toward the what if, as anxious rather than visionary, as maternal and teleological rather than artistic and open. Maternal attention, maternal imagination, was harnessed to the precious task of ensuring the life of the child. Without rejecting that resp responsibility, Wollstonecraft's experiment refuses that limit. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dara. That was fantastic. I'm going to be thinking about those like, ideas for such a long time. Um, so, um, and yeah, you can see you're getting your uh, well-deserved applause there. Um, uh, so yeah, that, that was amazing. Um, I really, really, I thought it was fantastic. Um, so we're changing direction now um, in a very exciting way uh, with our final speaker, Vielana Shuka. Uh, she recently completed her doctoral degree at the University of Toronto's Department of Cell and Systems Biology, where she applied genomics methods to study the biological mechanisms of uterine contraction initiation and labor timing. She also holds a master's degree in medical history and humanities from the University of York, where her thesis was supervised by Gothic women co-organizer, uh, Deborah Russell. Her article, Nursed Under His Own Eye, Co-Nursing Fathers and the Spectacle of Breastfeeding in the British Romantic Period will appear in 18th century fiction later this year. Yolanda's research interests broadly lie in the health and science humanities fields, with a particular focus on how science, medicine, and literature perspectives collectively shaped perceptions of so-called normal births, as well as birth timing complications and related maternal guilt narratives from the 18th century to our current historical moment. Her paper today is titled Cruel Confinements, Gothic Mothers and Early Labors in the Romantic Period. Thank you, Laura, um, and thank you, Deborah, for the invitation. I'm absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to speak on this panel. Um, before I begin, uh, just a quick reminder about the content of my presentation. Um, I will discuss some uh, emotionally um, difficult issues um, like domestic violence, miscarriage, uh, preterm labor, and divorce. Um, I recognize that this is sensitive subject matter, and for any attendees who uh, feel they might want to sit out this presentation, um, I'll just take a moment now to share my slides and give you the opportunity to do so if, if you so choose. Okay. May, may I ask if the title slide is visible? It's visible, Violana, but not as a presentation. Okay, sorry. Let's try that one more time. Okay. Um, and now? Now it's perfect. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. All right. Um, I would like to first turn to a late 18th century, um, oh, just uh, late 18th, I, I would like to first turn to a late 18th century ecclesiastical court case 
um, involving a married couple, Augusta and Thomas Evans, um, who were apparently mutually seeking a permanent separation from each other. Um, now, the pronouncing the pronounced sentence in this case in 1790 by presiding judge Sir William Scott um, extensively reviews the charge of domestic cruelty presented by Mrs. Evans' legal team against her husband. Some individuals testifying on behalf of Mrs. Evans allege that Mr. Evans forced his wife to stay in her room for extended periods of time without access to fresh air, that he physically struck her on numerous occasions, and that he denied her basic necessities like food. According to certain witnesses and her legal team, these purported behaviors were detrimental to Mrs. Evans and the children she was carrying during her pregnancies. For instance, the 11th article of the libel refers to one of the pregnancies in question and proclaims Mr. Evans is the cause of his wife's early entry into labor. But her team writes that Mrs. Evans was delivered of a child at seven gestational months, which premature birth was wholly occasioned by the pain, anxiety, and terror she was continually in from the cruel treatment of Mr. Evans. Uh, now, one of the many aspects of this case that I find particularly striking is the judge's rather testy response to one of the witnesses supporting this libel claim, a Mademoiselle Bobillier, who was a lady employed at one point in Mrs. Evans' service. In her testimony, Mademoiselle Bobillier insists that Mr. Evans neglected and harmed his then expectant wife during the course of another pregnancy, and that from her perspective, he is again solely responsible for ending the life of the child that Mrs. Evans is carrying. In response to this testimony, the judge addresses this witness directly. To Mademoiselle Bobillier, who takes it upon herself positively to swear that this premature delivery, I use her own words, was entirely occasioned by the unkind behavior of Mr. Evans to his wife and for want of proper attention to her during her pregnancy. Her deposition upon the face of it is highly colored and inflamed, very descriptive, full of image and epithet, something in the style really of the trash of a circulating library. Um, now this caught my attention because in light of all the contrary accounts of Mr. Evans' behavior by witnesses on either side, it would of course be very difficult to parse out and glean all the particularities of exactly what happened between the couple. Um, but what is less disputable is that the judge's remark here likens this witness's account of Mrs. Evans' experience of her pregnancy and its end to something like a scene from a novel. And by extension, his comment places Mrs. Evans in the position of a fictional character. Now, interestingly, um, several late 18th century novels feature characters who at one point go into labor before what we now call term. And these characters very frequently do so in response to some source of terror. Um, many of these works would be classified either as Gothic novels or as novels that incorporate some features of the Gothic genre in their narratives. As these excerpts illustrate, uh, one of the most common sources of early labor preceding terror in Gothic novels is domestic cruelty, when the, where the expectant mother is repeatedly subjected to excessive emotional torment at the hands of a despotic male figure, um, usually her husband or lover. Now, issues surrounding preterm birth and domestic cruelty arise in particular in Gothic writing, um, I think, for several reasons. We know, of course, of the especially high maternal mortality rates in the period. Um, so going into labor even at nine months likely instilled at least some degree of fear in many expectant mothers at this time. Um, but preterm birth would likely have brought with it an additional set of fears surrounding maternal and infant health and survival. Um, so even uh, if we think about today, um, after many medical advances have been made to make childbirth safer for both mother and child, um, some preterm infants do go on to live lives relatively free of health complications, um, but preterm birth remains um, a leading contributor to neonatal mortality and morbidity. Um, and in the 18th century, when preterm labor uh, would not have fallen under the category of a so-called natural labor that followed a nine-month course of gestation, um, this kind of birth may well have occupied a still more nebulous space in the era's cultural mindset toward parturition. Um, now, I have not found any example of um, medical writing in the 18th century that explicitly associates domestic cruelty with preterm birth. However, practitioners frequently cited maternal emotional distress as a key determinant, um, as we can see from John Aiken's ranked list of its, of its causes in his 1784 Principles of Midwifery. 
Furthermore, misconceptions uh, regarding preterm labor in the period might have spurred on additional confusion uh, among some couples. For example, um, Aristotle's masterpiece, which continued to be reprinted during and after the late 18th century, acknowledged the error of a belief that if a, man, if a married woman went into labor at seven months, that meant that automatically meant that she had been unfaithful to her husband and that the child's biological father, father must be someone else. Um, now, granted, the original first publication of this text predates the 1700s, um, but later works suggest that fears regarding labor timing and levels of confidence in proof of paternity persisted into the second half of the 18th century. For example, the history of Will Ramble, though mostly constituting fictional work, um, acknowledges or points to the possibility of apparent lingering disputes in some circles over whether a woman can give birth at times prior to that nine month benchmark. So the notion that preterm birth might, might signify illegitimacy uh, might well have raised concerns, uh, obviously regarding the fidelity of the mother, as well as, the, um, as well as potential concerns regarding the inheritance rights of that child. Um, so collectively, these fears surrounding preterm birth at this time um, again, the potential for very temporally overlaid birth and death of the infant, marital contention, um, questionable origins of preterm children and associated inheritance uh, legalities would make the Gothic novel a fitting literary medium for representations of such um, considered unnatural labors. But with this in mind, um, I will devote the remainder of my presentation to a romantic period work that intricately interrogates um, some not all, but some of these issues through the figure of the laboring and especially the prematurely laboring mother. This work, Melissa and Marcia, is the first novel of lesser known author Elizabeth Hervey, which appears to have been published by William Lane, Lane of Minerva Press in 1788. Um, and I hope to show that the portrayal of the figure of the Gothic mother in Hervey's text not only calls attention to the prevalence of domestic cruelty and to the question of what women in particular consequently inherit, um, but also like many of the more illustrious writers in the succeeding decade, complicates perceptions of how the Gothic is and how it should be read. Um, now I'll just mention now a spoiler alert that I, it is inevitable, I will have to divulge many of the, the key events in this novel. Um, Hervey's work sets a Gothic tone at the outset, um, in part through the narrative surrounding the birth experiences of the titular Melissa's and Marcia's mother, Mrs. Bumble. Hervey writes that soon after her marriage, Mrs. Bumble lay in of a son. This event gave her husband so much pleasure that for a short time he behaved to her with some attention. He was, however, relapsing fast into his old style when she was taken ill and died in childbed of twin daughters. He was a little shocked at her untimely end, especially when he reflected on his tyrannic conduct towards her. Um, so here the narrative implies that domestic cruelty plays a direct role in the mother's illness and her subsequent or perhaps consequent death in childbirth appears to stem in part from the neglect or a lack of proper attention from Mr. Bumble to his wife and from his relapse into his old tyrannical style. So Hervey begins with Mrs. Bumble's Gothic end during childbirth, but this event, as it's described, goes on to bear striking parallels to the labors later undergone by her daughter, Melissa. Now, fully appreciating these parallels requires first turning to a passage in the second volume where Hervey uses um, the most recognizable Gothic novel elements. Um, so it is at this point that we encounter the requisite castle and subterraneous passage. Uh, now, I will provide a little more background information here. Um, so at this point, the uh, twins have grown into young women and Melissa is married. And Melissa's husband, Lord Westland, has been trying from the beginning of their marriage to financially and emotionally provide for his wife. But he's hurt and frustrated with the lifestyle that she is leading. Melissa openly mocks him in public. She shows no interest in getting to know his friends or members of his social circle. She spends money frivolously and contracts debts. She holds secret meetings with a libertine and she associates with individuals who continually encourage her to continue living this way of life. So after numerous pleas to Melissa um, to ask her to change her ways, Lord Westland is at his end um, and his behavior, which uh, to this point has been tender and benevolent, takes a turn for the tyrannical when he takes her against her will to a castle in remote family owned grounds far from home. It is in this Gothic pile of building 
um, that he intends to keep Melissa from the corrupt influence of her social circle until she agrees to change her ways. Now, while her husband leaves her there with a few servants, the narrative for the first time begins to venture into the territory of possible supernatural events. Um, Melissa believes she sees messages traced out in the snow around the castle. Um, she later sits down to a meal and finds a letter addressed to her in her boiled egg. Um, she begins to hear apparent noises behind the tapestry in her room, and she increasingly grows more and more terrified that the castle is haunted. Um, now, the reader eventually discovers that an entirely rational explanation accounts for these events. Um, one of the servants, it turns out, has been fawning over Melissa, and he has written these messages and used the secret passageways of the castles to access her room and hide behind the tapestry. And Melissa's husband arrives when he hears of all these goings on. Um, she pretends to her husband that she has repented of her past actions. The servant is discovered and gently reprimanded. And Melissa goes home and secretly returns to her former way of life. Now, in the third volume, long after her imprisonment in the castle, Melissa gives birth to her first child. When Melissa becomes ill, her husband, alarmed, hurried her to town where she was prematurely delivered of a daughter. Though the Earl had passionately wished for a son, he was too delicate to let Melissa see his disappointment, and his tenderness never appeared so amiable as on this occasion. Unlike Mrs. Bumble's labor experience, here a very, very clear and distinct separation is made between Melissa's first labor and her husband's tyrannical behavior when he takes her to the castle. Um, and really the, the castle incident, um, at, at that point the reader is really steered to empathize more with her husband than, than with her. Um, but like Melissa's father, Lord Westland especially desires a son, but unlike Mr. Bumble, Melissa's husband treats his wife with tenderness and does have great affection for both her and her child. Despite the ongoing tumultuous nature of their marriage, Lord, Lord Westland continues to try to be supportive to her. In the final volume, however, Melissa meets and decides to run away with her husband's brother, Clifford Westland, and goes on to give birth a second time under very different circumstances. Clifford is seldom at home. He pays her no attentions and is wholly indifferent to her. In his company, she becomes emotionally crippled and prematurely gives birth a second time. After their child is born, Clifford seldom visits her, ignores his child, and Hervey goes on to write, soon Melissa was left quite alone and often destitute of many necessaries, which either Clifford could not or would not procure her. So at this point, Melissa is no longer in the castle. She's no longer in that site of imprisonment that so frequents Gothic novels. Nevertheless, the second labor is the moment that Melissa becomes a Gothic mother. Um, she is trapped by that repeated seldom of her husband, that neglect and emotional abuse of her child's father, and she inherits a fate very similar to that of her mother. Um, now, Hervey's transition of her heroine from the, from the Gothic castle setting to motherhood and then to Gothic motherhood and domestic life seems almost as if to express that encounters with castles pale in comparison in terms of their potential to harm women with the greater dangers that they actually represent. Um, so in, in so doing, her work draws attention to the ways in which the Gothic novel can and should be read. Um, and in many respects, I think Melissa and Marcia calls to mind later novels that pose similar questions, um, like Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey. And here, Hervey's novel likewise appears to ask the reader to look past a superficial reading of the Gothic beyond Melissa's time in the castle to the deeper fears exposing personal vulnerabilities that often lie behind Gothic tropes and the legitimacy of these fears for young women in an 18th century society. Indeed, the sentence for Evans versus Evans captures that blurred line that 18th century writers stride so well between Gothic fiction and, the, and its encoded dark real fears. If nothing else, the case proves that the Gothic mother is not restricted to the confines of the fictional page. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philana. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I yes, I, I've never come across a lot of that material, and it was just so interesting. And I can see real resonances actually with the papers on on Mariah. Um, so I'd like to invite questions now um, to, to all of our speakers. If the speakers would like to um, uh, 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 turn their cameras on, that's what I meant. Uh, turn their cameras on again, uh, so everyone can see their faces. And um, if you'd like to ask a question, um, you could either raise your little electronic hand 
um, or if you would like, pop it in the chat uh, with a queue in front of it. Um, I might, uh, just while we're waiting for people to do that, abuse my position as chair um, and just ask one question to the whole panel. Because one of the resonances that I saw between all of the papers really was the tension between a sense that Gothic experience is real for mothers. Um, that, that what looks like Gothic, sort of an overblown Gothic excess um, or what we might read as a kind of excessive gothic, sort of unduly dark, fantastical experience is represented um, by Wollstonecraft and, and indeed by um, poor Mrs. Is, was it Mrs. Evans, Augusta Evans in the trial um, at the beginning of uh, Violana's paper as, as real, you know, as a real um, and terrifying experience. The tension between that and the notion of Gothic as entertainment, as, as what is it, the trash of a circulating library. And it, it seems to me that in a way, you know, there's, there's a, a metaphor there for the degree to which distressing maternal experience is, is still often silenced within there's a kind of cultural silence imposed around sort of quite often around narratives of miscarriage, um, distressing labor experiences. Um, infant death and so forth. And that it, it seems almost as if the Gothic genre is being deployed perhaps as a way of commenting on the, a kind of patriarchal resistance to true narratives of maternal experience. Does that, does that seem right to the speakers or um, is, is that something you, you would agree with or want to nuance at all? I don't know who wants to go first. <laughs> I, I guess I can begin. Um, well, when I was um, reading Hervey's work in particular, um, I thought back to some of the questions that were raised um, in the Gothic Women's Panel in November about um, who, who reads the Gothic, how do we read the Gothic uh, correctly. Um, there, there are authors who seem to be um, poking fun at it while at the same time legitimizing it as a genre. Um, and I I guess I, I would agree with, with much of what you said. Um, and I think this, um, I, what I found particularly interesting about this, this novel that's, in, that's been published in 1788, it appears, um, is that um, that novel seems to be doing uh, a lot of what I think, uh, as, as I mentioned in my presentation, what Jane Austen would go on to do um, and, and what other writers either were doing at the time or would go on to do. Yeah, yeah, I can really see the resonances with often actually. Um, Dara, I think you were moving to, to say Yeah, that. I was, um, thank you for that question. I was thinking about um, the passage I showed from Mariah with this sort of um, who but a mother and oh but a mother and, and mm. there's no way to communicate this unless you just get it, right, mm. um, was echoing for me and I'm I mean I'm reaching backwards from the 19th century into to Wollstonecraft and and thinking about the gothic but it has a lot of echoes with some of with um some representations of um when when children died and maternal experience including in um I'm thinking of the language of one advice book in particular um, by an evangelical woman who's like, you know, when a kid gets sick and is almost going to die, like no one other than a mother can understand how that feels. And so there's something interesting in this, this holding on to intensity of experience for this particular subject relation, the subject position, right, as being like the, the most the most, right? The most intense, the, you know, the thing that can't be expressed, the moment where language fails, right? And that feels to me a little bit like there's this, there's this investment in the breakdown of representation around these, these sort of tragic or horrific moments that I think is maybe part of this intersection between the sort of Gothic as representation and the Gothic as lived experience is that there are, there are, there are, there's a cultural investment in certain experiences transcending language. Mm. Um, and it seems to me that the, that in this period, at least, 
Um, and in some ways now, but very differently, I think the, the, the death of a child from the experience of a, the caregiving parent is, is that kind of experience that is immediately sort of coded as horror mm -hmm. rather than um, tragedy from which one must both be haunted and recover and go on or, you know, so on. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with that because you also have a discourse in, in conduct manuals in general in which women are not supposed to reveal their emotions. I mean, and this goes back all the way to the, the late 17th century where Halifax is saying to his daughters, you shouldn't talk about your children because it's, it's like putting them out to perish. You shouldn't speak about your children in public. That's not appropriate, you know. Or, or other conduct manuals, like, um, I'm trying to remember which one, which says, you know, don't, don't let a man know how smart you are. <laughs> That's oh, just yeah, not Gregory. done. Isn't that Gregory who says, you know, yeah. Yeah, you know, don't reveal too much, you know, yeah. keep your emotions, keep your thoughts to yourself. That's not appropriate. So if a child, you know, don't mourn too much in public. You, you know, th those things are, are not to be confided, which, which again gets back to the issue about women's narratives and particularly mother's narratives. So I, I com agree completely with your talk about maternal rhetorics and, and how one gets them out there and how often they're so suppressed. Um, and then the notion that, well, they can be entertainment when mm. they're so excessive. Mm. And, and, and quite frankly, I, I think we still see that today, you know, it, it's, you know, the mother who commits a fanticide when, you know, she's lost it completely and she has no help. That's the one that makes the front pages, you know, and it's not the everyday wear and tear and stress that mothers, particularly under COVID, well, now you're hearing about it, but still it's, it's a good question, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, th th there seems to be a real, you know, that sense that when it when an emotion becomes so excessive, as, as, as you know, everyone said really that, that that it becomes implausible in the sense that those who are outside the experience are going, surely it's not that bad. Surely it's not that dark. Um, and, and that is the very moment uh, that representation uh, both uh, enabled and, and uh, oh, sorry, I think someone has their camera, um, their, their microphone on. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, it's not. Okay, I can see another question from Lynn Farron. Um, Lynn, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, um, that would be great. Hi. Hi there. Uh, three wonderful uh, presentations. Great. Thank you so much. Marilyn Frankis, your work has been important to me in my own research. Um, I'd like to address something to bring our Wollstonecraft and our bring our Gothic theories more forward and have each of the presenters address this. My research is more about current uh, representations of the goth maternal Gothic and in a feminist way. And it, I, I like to talk about the darkness of motherhood being very openly acknowledged right now in various forums, um, not just in literature, but as in art and film, and about how the pandemic, our global pandemic, uh, has in influenced this because of lockdown confinements of the maternal experience. And so I'd like to hear from um, the presenters about that issue. Um, thank you, Lynn, for your question. Um, uh, it's interesting that, that you bring up the, the pandemic and, uh, and motherhood. Um, I mentioned in my presentation that one of the, um, one of the common terrors associated with uh, premature labor is domestic cruelty. Another one is, is smallpox. Um, there, there seems to be a, um, 
a, a wealth of medical literature that in from the 18th century um, that acknowledges that um, that I guess what we would now consider in infections, um, viral infections, um, particularly smallpox, can induce premature labor. Um, and uh, I'm I'm sure uh, you and and other attendees have seen in in the papers that with with the lockdowns came um, very contrary accounts of uh, what COVID-19 was doing to um, premature labor rates. Like I, I, I remember during this time, literally every week, the New York Times would publish uh, a story that contradicted the story they would publish the week before. Um, so one week they would say, oh, preterm birth rates are down because you know everyone is staying at home, everyone is afraid, and there's a lower incidence of um, viral induced preterm labor. And then the next week, it would be, you know, COVID is, um, uh, th these lockdowns are causing, are, are causing women stress and they're causing more premature labor. So um, I, I guess I, I just thought of, my mind went back to that when I, um, when I heard your question. And um, I, I think that that's um, something that, you know, when we're thinking about a pandemic today, it, it's something that can resonate uh, with what a lot of mothers in the 18th century um, were experiencing with, with their own, um, with, with the epidemic uh, that was um, prevalent in that period. I, it's a splendid question, Lynn. And, and as Verlana was talking, I was thinking about the New York Times hotline where women, where mothers could call and just scream and just yell because they were so stressed and frustrated and, and they needed a venue to express their, their anger and their anxiety. Um, darkness could mean many, many things. Um, and I, I think we have been living through dark times and, and mothers have been under enormous stress. And I think, I would like to think that society has recognized that in a variety of ways not only in terms of childcare, but mothers leaving the workforce to take care of children, to take care of el doing elder care, doing all sorts of kinds of care. Um, and I think there's been a recognition of that. I'd like to think that there's been a recognition of that. It's not fully clear to me that people are fully recognizing the care that mothers need to do the care, to give the care that they are giving. Um, and from my perspective, and this is a data set of one, um, I think that's an ongoing issue, at least in my country in the United States. Um, I can't speak for other countries. Um, it's something that I think we need to address. Um, in other countries, I think they're better than the United States on this. Maybe someday we will get to it. I was thinking, um, Lynn, in that question, you mentioned something about the darkness of motherhood being acknowledged now. And I was thinking um, that, that, that there's a way in which um, the thing that almost never appears from the sort of inside emotionally in 18th or 19th century texts is, is maternal ambivalence. Um, so that's a version of like what Wollstonecraft is critiquing, these like passive mothers who can't deal with their kids, right? Clearly they're ambivalent. Um, but that there's a way in which that emotion, which is not neutral, is actually also very intense, nonetheless gets coded as a kind of neutral and therefore like narratively uninteresting state of being. And I feel as though in some of the, in more contemporary representations of, of motherhood, including in sort of contemporary Gothic, you, you, that becomes a kind of new and, and rich fodder. The notion that maternal ambivalence is a sort of category of being and one of the one of part of the range of emotions of this that are associated with this subject position. Um, I think actually that's probably dropped away with the pandemic um, as other things and more heightened, more obviously heightened states have gotten more attention. But I was I, I'm thinking about that the 
um, uh, the the this isn't an example of the Gothic, but the Maggie Gyllenhaal movie that was just that she directed is um, one piece of that, I think, or one example. I mean, you're referring to the movie about the academic where the job and childcare are in conflict. Is the lost daughter? Yes, uh, yeah. that one. Yeah. Well. I don't know. I guess I would suggest a claim for Defoe's mothers, like Mal and Roxana, seem to have maternal ambivalence. Fair. Good point. Okay. It's interesting, though, isn't it? Because ambivalence in that respect is often linked to a sense of, you know, moral degradation. Um, that there's that there there is. I can't think of an attempt to legitimate maternal ambivalence in 18th century texts, you know, to, to, to inhabit that, that space and see it as a, a kind of, I mean, you know, even uh, Wollstonecraft, much as I love her, there's something quite sensualist about the way she depicts the ideal as a kind of embrace of an instinctive maternal feeling. And even now we we, we have a tendency to pathologize maternal ambivalence, I think, rather than connecting it with um, social states like um, confinement um, and, you know, the, the shrinking of experience, perhaps um, frustration, um, rising levels of domestic abuse, I think have, you know, sometimes been connected with the onset of maternity. Um, so, you know, there's an interesting way in which we, I think, tend to locate maternal ambivalence in the kind of fault of the mother rather than the society that that might be contributing to her um to her sense of ambivalence perhaps um i mean i think certainly you know De defoe's tendency to have moles sort of i mean it's like you have to keep track of, of of the children they just kind of keep disappearing you know there's so many of them and she very rarely appears to experience emotion on that front um which is you know its own its own peculiar um piece of narration but yeah um yeah so um I can I, Sophie Hayward um has had her hand up for a really long time so I much as I'm really interested in that point I think um as we're moving towards the the end of of, of the seminar um I'm gonna Sophie can I invite you to ask your question thank you um, I really enjoyed all those papers especially because I've recently had a baby so I feel like it's quite prescient the idea of maternal ambivalence, but something that particularly struck me was um, Marilyn talking about the womb-like nature of the prison. It was a, a passing comment, but it reminded me of Matthew Lewis and the monk and his description of the catacombs as like a womb and how Angela Carter and the bloody chamber, the way she describes these labyrinthian passages are very womb-like. And there's this association of pregnancy or the womb or maternity in general with death. And I find that juxtaposition significant because something that is giving life is often used in these dead end metaphors, like the, the dead end of the prison or of being stuck in a catacomb. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on why something that's essentially about giving life has become so intertwined with death and if this might be the patriarchal influence of trying to contain mothers instead of them having the possibility to give life and therefore being quite a forceful agent to be reckoned with, like their diminishment and association with places of death and decay is something to do with the undermining of female agency. Um, I just, I just think about the danger of childbirth, <laughs> um, right? So, so it feels to me as though um, there, there is no childbirth without the very real prospect of death, right? Death for the mother, death for the child, um, the, 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 the difficulties and the possibilities and the the fragility of that moment and the way life and death are are utterly connected in that moment, um, I think makes it actually feel to me as though um, wombs maybe make perfect sense as um, 
death metaphors, even at the same time, and maybe also because it seems so shocking or jarring. But um, it actually feels to me as though there's um, that with the medicalization of childbirth, there's actually been um, part of the progressivist narrative, part of the advances of medical science have been to, to distance childbirth from death conceptually as well as practically. Um, and, and so there's something really interesting about thinking about and trying to imagine oneself back into those moments when, um, when they were much closer, right? When, when, you know, uh, um, a relative or close friend's pregnancy is like both a cause for celebration and this moment of like, okay, like we don't know what's going to happen. Um, things could go hard. This is natural and women die. This is natural and babies die, right? So I feel like there's there's something really interestingly um, both light and dark in, in thinking about that. I have some thoughts about this, but Deborah has her hand up. <laughs> um, but please, I... please go, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 no. I've already spoken. You should chime in here. No, I had I had another question for everybody. So if it's if it's if it's more on this, then 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 do go for it. <laughs> OK, then um, I, I was thinking of of uh, womb and tomb, not only for the reasons that Dara's just um, commented on but part of it is, is that giving birth is a very powerful thing and it's a thing that women do and men don't um and and that that's very simple and very obvious but the desire to control women's body is is a considerable thing um but it was these these prisons as containment places are often dark and gloomy and constructed as womb-like spaces, but because they're often spaces of death, they have that tomb-like connotation as well. In the early 18th century, tomb and womb was a common rhyme in Augustan poetry. Um, I believe it's Ellen Pollock who writes about this. And, and for the Augustans, and you see this in texts like Pope's Dunciad and, and Swift, you know, the overproduction is, is, is a dangerous thing. You know, uh, quantity seems to threaten them in terms of quality. You see this in the Dunciad with dullness and the overproduction of literature. So, so and, and, and they feel threatened by female overproduction in particular. They feel threatened particularly by the rise of women writers in the early 18th century. So the production of female narrative and female writers gets connected with the female body in certain ways that gets connected back with other kind of creative metaphors. We conceive ideas, we conceive babies, you know, and this goes back to, I think, ancient Greece, that metaphor goes way, way back. So tombs and wombs and female bodies are all linked in, in multiple ways in terms of how the West forgive me, conceptualizes women and the power that women have to generate, generate children, generate narrative. Because when we generate children, we're, we're generating narrative, right? We're generating familia narrative, we're generating social narrative, and it's all interconnected. So that's what was going on in my head when I threw that in there amidst everything else. Um, yes, I, I would just very quickly, um, Sophie, congratulations. Um, uh, I and I completely agree with um, Dara's and and Marilyn's be beautifully articulated responses. Um, the only additional thing that I would add is that um, what, with the womb and the catacomb connection, the womb is is multi layered. If I if I might put my scientist hat on, you know, you have to get through the endometrium, then you have to get through the perimetrium, then you have to get through the myometrium, which is what's actually causing the contractions and embedded within these tissues are, you know, blood vessels and immune cells. And um, it's just a very, um, it's a, it's a play to, to get to the fetus. It's a, you, you have to get through a lot to, to get there. So um, I, I think in, in many ways, just 
kind of the um, visualizations of the uterus could contribute to to this um, connection of something that is deep, buried, and and definitely not nowhere near exposed to the surface and uh, requires getting through multiple layers. Deborah, do you want to uh, ask your question now? We're coming <laughs> yeah. up to the end of the of the seminar, but I'm sure we can have one more. Sorry, sorry. Yes, abusing abusing my privileges. Um. So yeah, firstly, those are just three wonderful papers. They 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 really were. Um. And I had kind of questions for everybody, but I'm going to try and merge them together into a, a Franken question. Um. So yes, what I was thinking about, I was thinking about um female inheritances of suffering it might kind of lead out of that last question that kind of twist on the gothic tradition of being obsessed with what is inherited um but the idea of kind of parallel experiences that mothers and daughters keep having in in the gothic and the the idea that that to be a woman is to be suffering I think it's Sophia Lee's the recess she says are you still alive and suffering with those two things just go together for for a woman um so what I was thinking kind of coming out of that for Lana, I was I was wondering about whether you have a sense of, of whether the experience of pregnancy and birth in itself is implied to infect uh, to affect that kind of uh, inheritance, the kind of whether there's a sense of a kind of transmission of maternal emotion in, in the womb that goes with those anxieties about the effects of maternal fear, perhaps. Um, and then just more generally, I'm kind of interested to hear kind of how gothic texts like Wollstonecraft's whether they they give a sense of inherited trauma kind of in and of itself independent of later circumstances that there's an inevitability of that um and this might tie into the different endings of 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 wrongs of women you know whether there's a kind of tension between that sense of inevitable suffering and then the desire to change things um so so yes um inherited suffering that, that, that that's my franken quest Um, thank, thank you, Deborah, for your question. Um, I think the novel that best captures what it is that you're describing is Anna Mackenzie's Dusseldorf or the Fratricide. Um, it was published in 1798. Um, it's, a, it's a very difficult novel to, to get through. It's extremely circuitous, um, both in terms of the way that it's written and just geographically where all the characters go. It's very difficult to kind of keep track. But um, what I remember from that is the, um, the laboring mother um, who, who goes in also, again, goes into labor because of uh, her emotionally abusive husband. Um, no sooner does she pass, uh, no, no sooner does she pass away than her sister takes on the, um, the uh, imprison, the kind of imprisonment and the emotional abuses of um, her, her late sister's husband. And then that passes on to, um, I can't remember which, I, I don't remember if it's the, the um, first character's child or the second character's child. It's just this, exactly what you're describing, this kind of inevitable chain of connectivity. Like I said, no sooner does, does one character die than another character takes that on. And then um, the child in question, her adoptive mother who never meets either of these two female characters um, you know, who's leagues away from them um, is also um, kind of like in a contagious way imbibing this kind of um, emotional distress and anxiety and fear. So um, I, I think that is prevalent across all novels, but I think that's the one that kind of captures that sentiment uh, the most clearly. So thank you. Uh, I was thinking, Deborah, in relation to that question, I was thinking of Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights, which I think is, I mean, I think that's the project of that novel is to, is to, is to think through that question and to think about um, the mechanisms and possibilities both of inherited trauma and its disruption. Um, I think of that novel as in part sort of enacting on a kind of extended scale one of the the sort of epilogal gestures of of that that really start to dominate um 
realist fiction, but maybe all almost fiction in the in the mid Victorian period, which is that you can't conclude the novel just with a marriage. You have to conclude the novel with both a marriage and babies. So um, you get this kind of promise or reassurance that like the the disruptions and the traumas that have that have occupied the narrative and animated the narrative um, aren't going to continue, right? So Jane Eyre can't conclude until not only are Jane and Rochester married, but she puts the that his son into his arms for the first time and and that kind of thing and and Wuthering Heights in part I think is um doesn't end with babies but does sort of have this this sense that that there has to be a real sort of exorcism almost an exercising of the trauma in order to start over or or move beyond whatever that kind of um almost like temporally carceral like the, that repetition compulsion that's happening with the trauma, with the inherited trauma. Yes, I, I think that's right. And, and, and I think Heathcliff is forcing the inherited trauma in, in that novel. Um, it strikes me in, in the wrongs of women, you know, Mariah is writing this narrative to her daughter to try to prevent the inherited trauma. You know, I'm 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 telling you this narrative, my dear daughter. So so you don't make these mistakes. It's trying to foreclose the repetition of the narrative um, to avoid the inherited trauma. Um, and and I think many of those um, teaching narratives from mothers to daughters were attempting to do that. You know, learn from my experience. Um, that doesn't mean that those daughters wouldn't make mistakes of their own. Mm. Um, every generation tends to make mistakes of its own, but but try not to make mine, or try to learn from mine if you can. Yeah, what always strikes me about that um, pedagogical narrative in Wrongs of Women, though, is that it, it sort of stands out to me a little because Mariah is also acknowledging that if her daughter does the things she recommends, like, you know, being frank about her feelings and following her own path, and you know, she's advocating it, but she also says, this will be difficult, you know, you'll need to be brave, this will be hard, and in a way she's acknowledging the possibility that she could end up in the same place, you know, that I think it's part of a weird tension in the character of Mariah, where she makes a lot of conventional mistakes, but she's also this extraordinary woman, and it, it, the characterization is either confused or multifaceted, depending on how you want to consider it, um, but there seems to be the sense that if, if she molds the daughter according to the sort of more um, revolutionary manifestation of Mariah, who kind of you know abjures her marriage vows and 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 insists on her um, right to um, be a mother outside of marriage, for instance. Um, that that if, if her daughter follows that path, there's there's equal potential for a gothic ending. It's like the confinement is everywhere, you know. Um, that that's always sort of yeah. I never quite know how I, how I feel about that particular narrative. I agree, and the problem still is the law's not on their side. Mm. And until yeah. you can change the law, it's it's still an uphill battle. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the problem. You know, Lynn's just pointed out we must also acknowledge that Mary Shelley herself told her own maternal story of the Gothic in response to her mother Mary, which I think, yeah. Um, that's a, a very important reading of, of Frankenstein, I think. Um, uh, Violana, did you have, I'm conscious I interrupted what might potentially have been a <laughs> contribution to that. Um, uh, yeah, yes, no no worries. I just, um, yes, uh, someone brought up Mary Shelley, so I had to, uh, had to. <laughs> um, well, this has been a fascinating discussion where we're, we're coming past um, uh, the, the time of the end of the seminar, um, uh, for which I take full responsibility as chair, but this has been fantastic. So I would really like to thank our speakers again, uh, Marilyn Franklis, Dara Reguignon and Violana Schuka, three fantastic papers, and they've given me so much to think about. Um, and I'm sure everybody else here. Um, so thank you very much again. Um, 
I'm going to end the seminar shortly, um, but um, thank you all also for coming. Um, thank you for the questions and the contributions and the chat. Um, you know, everybody's attendance always really makes these seminars such a fulfilling experience. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing you at the next one, uh, which is our next event uh, is Queer Gothic on Monday, the 23rd of May with speakers William Brewer, Ardell Heffler Thomas and Evan Hills Gledhill. Uh, the event writes up, um, so if you'd, if you'd like to head on over and sign up straight away, you can do that right after the seminar. Um, but we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep reminding you uh, on Twitter as well. And you can see that, that Lauren's just popped the event right in the chat there for your convenience. So if anyone wants to sign up to that uh, now, um, that would be great. Let's get the ball rolling and we'll look forward to seeing you in May. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye everyone.